afternoon. Welcome to the Allen School Colloquium. Uh, I am delighted this afternoon to introduce to you Jacob Eisenstein, who is an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Uh, Jacob is a leader in applying machine learning to the area of computational social science. And what that is, he'll tell us shortly. Uh, this is a really exciting uh, area. Uh, and uh, Jacob has been a real leader in this space. I believe he's taught the first course on uh, computational journalism. I'm not sure if we're going to hear about that this afternoon, but you can ask him uh, later offline. Uh, before he went to Georgia Tech, Jacob was uh, at Carnegie Mellon University as a postdoc. Uh, before that, he did his PhD at MIT. Uh, and before that, he was an undergrad in the Symbolic Systems Program at Stanford. Um, so we are really happy to have him here today. Let's give him a warm welcome. OK, thanks a lot, Noah. Um, yeah, it's exciting to be here. I was here in 2015 for the uh, Jelinek Summer Workshop on Language Technology for six weeks. That was a blast. Um, I've had a good time getting to meet some of you this morning and look forward to meeting more of you um, this evening and tomorrow. So um, that didn't work. OK, so um, today, these are two headlines from the last month or two. And it's, a, I think, symptomatic of a trend that tech companies see themselves um, beset by challenges that are not really purely computational challenges, right? These are, these are essentially societal challenges, yet they're existential challenges for some of these companies. Um, and I think the reason this is happening is because um, computation has really succeeded. And um, computation has made itself ubiquitous um, in our social lives and in our political lives. And this is what has led to new problems like echo chambers and, and, and bots and viral hoaxes and hate speech. Um, but as well as bringing new challenges, um, the fact that computation is now everywhere in our lives uh, also offers new opportunities, um, opportunity to measure and understand social phenomena, address social challenges at scale. And, and perhaps by leveraging these opportunities, um, that'll contain maybe the seed to solving some of these challenges as well. Um, so this is the setting in which I'd like to sort of situate computational social science as an emerging discipline um, which applies computational methods to research questions um, and to theories that come from social science. Um, and there are many ways you could imagine computation. You know, computation plays a role in all kinds of research endeavors now. And there are many ways you could imagine computation playing a role in social science. Um, there's a distinction that I find helpful. This comes from Princeton sociologist Matt Sigalnik. He distinguishes between what he calls ready-made approaches. So ready-made approaches, like you, you write some high-quality software, um, and you sort of throw it over the fence. And, um, and people, social scientists, are increasingly um, computationally savvy themselves. And so you write a piece of software like Allen NLP, and that allows social scientists to do text analysis um, that's relevant to their, to, their, to their data. Or you write a piece of software like Gephi, and that allows social scientists to do social network analysis that's relevant to their research. So this is sort of one approach to computational social science. It's not the one that I take. So the, the approach that I take is the, is the, the alternative, um, which, is, which, which Sigalnik calls a custom build. And so this is sort of a, a one-off solution, like a bespoke computational solution to a social science problem. And, and ideally, this is something that sort of existing computational methods could not do before. And so you have to innovate um, in computer science in order to get the, the result and the method that you desire um, to achieve your ends in social science. And, and I think these two, these two approaches to computational science, of course, they're, compl uh, of course they're complementary. Right? So the hope is that you build enough of these sort of custom solutions, and maybe people abstract them and are able to integrate them into something that's more of a ready-made tool for the next generation of social scientists in the future. Um, but the projects that I'll talk about today, all three are sort of in this custom build vein. So these are things that, before we did this research, they could not be accomplished with existing computational techniques. Um, and we, we had to innovate in computer science to do them. And, so, and, and the stuff that I'll tell you about, too, I guess each of these projects is, 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 is publishable in computer science, um, and in many cases also publishable in, in, in a social science discipline as well. Um, so three pieces to the talk in terms of the concrete projects. Um, and these sort of, I, I tried to pick kind of verbs to start each of these bullet points that, that, could, that could sort of tell you something about the roles that computation can play in social science. Um, exploring data, operationalizing constructs, and I'll, I'll talk more about what that means when I get to that part, and then measurement, particularly measurement of causal effects. But let's jump into the first piece, exploring the construction of what I'm calling social meaning in networks. And so social meaning, that's the way that we, we use language to create and affect the social relationships that we participate in. 
and i think a great example of that is the use of address terms in language. so an address term is something like mr. lebowski or the dude. and so the sort of the joke with this movie is that he's sort of this laid back guy, but he he sort of insistent that everyone that he interacts with interacts with him on his terms, and his terms being that you can only call him the dude because that's the that's the that's the sort of social relationship that he wants to have with people. um so from a linguistic perspective, you could ask how to address terms like mr. lebowski and dude, how do they create social meaning? um but the 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 social meaning that we create with the people that we talk to, it's not sort of purely, you know one relationship at a time, one diet at a time. actually, each relationship that we have well, that's situated in a larger network that we have to participate in. Um, and it's not the case that we can just make a series of independent decisions about how we want to relate to people. There has to be some kind of holistic structure that emerges from that as well. Um, and so um, in this sense, what, what's needed here is, is a model not just on the, the, the tech side. You could do something you know, with a topic model, for example, and hope to get topics that relate to social meaning in some way. Um, and not something on a, on just on the network side. So you could look up the network side, and you could say, oh, you know, this particular dyad has a lot of mutual friends. It's a strong tie. This particular dyad doesn't have any mutual friends. It's a weak tie. But what we really want is a model that, that integrates both of those two modalities um, and makes some kind of inference from the two of them that you couldn't make from either of them individually. OK, so I'll try to formalize this a little bit more. Um, the setting here is that we observe some network structure, so we know who talks to whom. Um, and so this network structure is an undirected graph. Um, and then on each edge in this network, um, I have a vector of counts of linguistic features. And so the counts could be, well, they are in this research, um, for each possible way of addressing somebody. And so we have a, a pre-processing step for building that lexicon that I won't have time to talk about, but you could ask me about that. Um, but on each one of these dyads, I have a count for the number of, number of times in which each possible reference term has been used. Um, and then the idea is that these counts um, come from some kind of latent variable model, where each of these dyads has some kind of latent relationship. That's I'm using the, the symbol y for this. Um, and that's, that's going to that's gonna generate the features that we observe. OK, so specifically um, in the formulation here, um, the, the, the feature counts are just drawn uh, as, a, as from a multinomial distribution. So this is a distribution over counts of events, um, where the parameter of this distribution is a, is a vector of frequencies. And so you expect that the relative frequency of any particular event in the vector of counts is approximately equal to the, well, the expectation is, is equal to the, uh, to the frequency in the parameter. Um, and so if we could estimate theta, that would give us a distribution over the address terms for each edge type. And in a sense, that would tell us what each of these, uh, what, the, what, the, what the different settings of the latent variable mean. OK, so what I've given you so far really hasn't used the network in any interesting way. It's just really a mixture model over dyads. Um, when I want to bring the network into the picture, you can ask yourself, OK, you know, are some label configurations, some ways of arranging the latent variable on the network, are some configurations better than others? Why would we think that that would be the case? Um, well, if we look at sociology, um, there's a really interesting theory called structural balance theory. Um, and it describes networks of, of a specific type. So in, in, in structural balance theory, um, the networks, the labels on the edges of the network indicate whether the, each dyad is a friend or an enemy. And then the principle, the principle of structural balance theory is that certain triads are stable and others are unstable. And if a triad is unstable, it means that um, it's likely to, to, over time, to, to switch to one of the stable triads. And so you know, the, the sort of consensus principle is that this particular triadic configuration is unlikely um, because these two people are enemies, yet they have some friend that they have in common. And so either one of them is going to convince the friend to join their side and defeat the enemy, or maybe the more positive outcome is that the friend convinces the two enemies to put aside their differences. Um, so that's, that's the point of view from structural balance theory. And what's cool about this is that this is a theory, as articulated here, that's just on the level of triads. Um, but in fact, what emerges from that is that if you, if you have structural balance, then in fact there are global properties of the network that emerge from that. So if structural balance holds, then the entire network partitions into factions, basically. And that's something that you can prove just on the basis of these triads. Um, now, this is a particular type of network with a particular type of social meaning. And that may not be the most relevant thing when we think about the social meaning of address terms like Mr. Lebowski and Dude. Um, so in the case that I want to deal with, um, the magnitude and the direction of the effect for each triad type is unknown. So here I'm considering this the case where there's only uh, the, the, latent, the, binary, the, the latent variable has to be binary. It can only take two possible values. Um, these are the four triads that could emerge after rotation. And, and the, 
the, the, the stability of each triad is not known in advance. So this is just going to be another parameter that we have to estimate. Um, and you could view this as a form of structure induction. So what we're doing is we're adding um, essentially a prior piece of information that says there's going to be some score for the configuration of labels um, on the network um, that's sort of prior to what we infer from the text. Um, and that score is going to be based um, on the, the counts of triads that we have in the network. Okay, so I'll formalize this a little bit more in terms of the, the sort of the math behind the prior distribution. It's just, it's essentially a log linear model. So um, this is, a, a, again, a prior distribution over labelings of the network. That's what the bold Y means. Again, G is the, the network itself. Um, and eta and beta are going to be parameters. So first I have features on dyads, and I have weights of those features. So um, a feature on a dyad might tell you, okay, these two people um, have 10 mutual friends. Um, so that's a feature of the dyad uh, alone. Um, then I have a set of triads in the graph, and I have features for each. Ro I have, I'm sorry, I have parameters for each rotated triad type. So is this um, uh, uh, for, for each of those four triad types that I showed you before? I'll have a different parameter, and that's something that I'm going to have to estimate. Um, and then I just have a normalizing constant to make sure that this thing sums to one over all possible labelings. Yeah. Quick question: Why do I have features also on the individual nodes? Uh, the properties of individuals are going to be. So that we'll put that in the likelihood. So we'll put that in the likelihood, I guess. So so the so, I guess we're not assuming we know anything about the nodes um, in terms of additional covariates. But there's there's no reason you couldn't incorporate, you know, yeah. If you had some other sort of co like the age or something, you had some other kind of covariate information, you could you could put that in too. Yeah. Okay. So that's the. That's the prior, and then um, and this factors over dyads and triads in the network. Um, I already gave you the likelihood that just tells you that the distribution of uh, linguistic features is multinomial indexed on the relationship type, um, and so the joint probability just is the product of these, these two terms. Um, but in fact, this model allows us to answer a lot of questions about networks. Um, so you could ask, what is the relationship of each dyad? And that's what you get from doing inference on, on why. Um, you could ask, how are social relationships expressed in language? And that's what you get by looking at the parameter theta. Um, and then you could ask, what sort of structural regularities emerge in these types of networks? And that's what you get from looking at the, the parameters of the prior, beta and eta. And again, beta is the sort of stability of each triad type, and eta are weights on features of the dyads. Okay. And again, what's x here again? So x are the linguistic features. So X is like the counts of different forms of address. And then Y is? And Y is the latent, the unknown latent label of the, of the dive. The graph structure is observed, yeah. Yeah, so we know who talks to whom. Uh, we, just, we, just, we just know it. Yeah, we just know it. Yeah, it's so not a random variable. Yeah. Yeah. OK, and so we're going to apply this model to a data set of uh, 600 movie scripts. Uh, movie data is super interesting for this kind of stuff because um, the types of relationships and the types of address terms people use is incredibly diverse. You can imagine like a courtroom drama versus like a movie about a bunch of guys on a submarine um, versus like you know a medieval like history kind of thing. So all kinds of different forms of address can emerge in these movies. So kind of interesting scenarios. And the networks in these sorts of movies you know range from like five people to thirty people or something. So relatively small networks. Um, but you know, before we get to results on that data, um, there are sort of two computational problems that emerge with this model. So first of all, just, just, op, just even if I was given the parameters of the objective, um, finding the optimal labeling is NP hard. So there's, um, there's a proof that I think is reduction from vertex cover um, for, for, for that fact. Um, and so to handle that issue, um, we iterate over, um, so we make a, a mean field relaxation. Um, so essentially for each dyad, I have a variational parameter that says, What's my belief about what the, what the label is for that dyad? Um, and then we iteratively update just um, uh, uh, the sort of variational approximation that's a product of those individual potentials. Um, so learning is also hard, right? So I've introduced this um, uh, normalizing constant z. Uh, this requires summing over all possible labelings of the network. There's no way to do that efficiently either. Um, and so we get approximate gradients by applying noise contrastive estimation. This, is, this essentially means that we sample um, labelings of the network that are incorrect. Um, and, we, um, and we get an approximate gradient by comparing against those. And this, this learning, I should say, is, in, is, is, is sort of the inner loop of an EM, because um, we, don't, we don't observe label data at all. So this is the inner loop of an EM, EM style algorithm. So in the E step, I'm updating these distributions over, over uh, 
I'm updating these Q distributions over dyad labels. In the M step, I'm updating my parameters. OK, so first sort of a face validity, when I run the model forward with two possible settings for the latent variable, these are the two sort of clusters that emerge. And I'm showing the words that are particularly indicative um, of each cluster. So um, I think some structure kind of really stands out here. On the cluster on the left, these are sort of high formality kinds of terms. Um, the cluster on the right, these are, these are informal. Um, kinds of terms. Um, reviewer like raised a question about this term sun um, being in the formal cluster. Um, that reviewer was not from the south in the United States. Um, it definitely speaks to sort of a power asymmetry, I think, to use that term. Um, but um, you know, this is sort of a face validity, just to look at it yourself. Um, we did something a little more quantitative than that. Um, so we did an intrusion detection task. So what this means is that we bring in raters, um, just, just people, and we show them three terms from one list and one term from the other list. That's the intruder. And we ask them to figure out which term is the intruder term. Um, so what's interesting is that so in the full, when we run the full model, they're able to find this intruder term in 73% of the cases. You know, the chance rate would be 25%. When we show them a model that we learn without the structural prior on the network, so without this sort of complicated distribution over um, possible labelings of the network, um, they only find the intruder 52% of the time. So incorporating there's no additional textual information, just incorporating the sort of structural information about the network actually means that the model makes much better inferences about text. Yeah. How are the participants given the information in the model? <laughs> so we just show them like. I pick three terms from the left list and one term from the right list, shuffle them up, and say which is the, which is the outlier out of these four. And I do that several times. So but when this was generated by the model, you get the 70% versus the 52%. So the full model, I get 73%. When I give them a crippled model that doesn't know about the, the sort of structural features. Um, what do you mean by give them a crippled model? Is just to just give them these terms from the model? That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, out, sorry, output from two different models. This is, this is synthetic. Sorry? This is a real, uh, you're training this on that uh, movie data. Yeah. yeah. Just trained on movie data, no supervision at all. Um, and then we, then we bring in, just bring in people. And a clustering model yeah. rather than this one? Because so the, the text only model is basically a clustering model, right? It's basically EM clustering. Okay. So it's, it's multinomials, and there, there's not a lot more to it. OK, so we can show um, pictures that emerge for specific films. This is the first and original Star Wars, A New Hope. Um, the, the dotted, the dotted uh, edges, I think, are from the, are from the informal um, cluster of terms that emerge. The solid blue edges are from the, the formal, term that are, the formal uh, set of terms that emerge. Um, I think Vader is not in this picture because he doesn't actually talk to any of these characters in the movie. Um, but the way the data set is constructed, they only show you data where it's just two characters talking to each other. So if it's, a, if it's like a group of characters talking, then we don't, we don't see that in the data because we wouldn't, we wouldn't know what to do with that anyway. Um, so yeah, so what's interesting, right, you get the sort of triad. The triads are all sort of informal. Um, and then the more, the, the, the more formal edges are between these sort of outlier individuals. Um, this is a bigger picture. This is from the movie Ghostbusters. So the original Ghostbusters, if you don't remember, are Venkman's Bankman, that's the Bill Murray character's stance, is the uh, Dan Aykroyd, and Spangler is Harold Ramis. And so they're um, informal uh, relations together again. Um, formal relations are with Dean Yeager fires the Ghostbusters from Columbia at the beginning of the movie. That's a formal relationship. Um, and of course, the, the bad guy is, is Peck, which is the evil EPA regulator. Um, and that's a formal relationship as well. Um, so last sort of piece about this. Um, these are the weights on the triads that emerge, and I'm labeling the I'm labeling the um, I'm labeling the edges as T and V. That actually is sort of a, a reference to the sociolinguistic theory about um, about form, form about forms of address. It's like you can think of it as like tu and vu in French. Um, so T is the informal. I guess it comes from Latin, so tu and vos. Um, and so the the triads that are prefer that the model learns to prefer it prefers a triad of everyone on informal terms. It gets a positive weight. It likes a triad with everyone on formal terms. Um, it dislikes both of the heterogeneous triads, but the one that it, it, it's sort of more, more tolerant of this one. And I didn't really understand why, why this triad was better than this one. Um, but my, my graduate student explained it to me. He said, look, in this triad, like the guy on the bottom right, that's the professor. And these two are the students. 
and so the students are informal with each other and they're formal with the professor. And so he had sort of a story that he could tell, whereas with this triad it doesn't really make as much sense. Okay, so um, that's sort of the story with that paper. Um, the lex address term lexicons that we built um, were then adopted in a later project from Stanford on racial disparities in the language that police officers used during traffic stops. So, you know, it's, it's fun to show um, pictures about Ghostbusters and Star Wars, but actually there are some, you know, I think implications that come from this kind of work that are more, um, that are more um, urgent. Um, I should say this project is part of an ongoing effort um, towards understanding social meaning and language. So address terms are one facet of that, but there are other devices that people have to create and to modulate social meaning and language. And this is a project that's being carried on um, by my PhD student, Uma Shanti, um, and a sociolinguist at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Scott Keasley. Okay, so that's it for the piece on social networks. I'm going to move to the next part of the talk, unless there are more questions now. Okay, so. Um, in this part of the talk, I want to talk about um, this concept of influence. So, in general, right, like when we do, when people do social science, um, you know, there are these sort of constructs that I think we have a lot of intuitions about and we'd like to theorize about. Um, but it's some, often hard to, 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 to think about relating those concepts um, to, to things that we can objectively measure in data. And that's what I mean by operationalizing these constructs. So influence is a good example. It's something that, that everyone sort of agrees exists. Like everyone believes that there are people that are influential or people that are not influential or that influence explains how things happen. Um, but it's not so easy to say what influence is. Um, one sort of account of this that I really like is from this uh, sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu. He talks about a, a particular form of influence that he calls symbolic power. And it's the ability to control how others use language, so to determine what the boundaries of legitimate language are. Um, and so sort of another take on what Bourdieu means by influence is to think about um, language change and explanations for language change as revealing something about who holds social, sociocultural influence. So who is it whose language is able, who is it who, who's able to, 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 to shape the direction of the language that other people use? Now this is something, you know, is this something that we can observe? And it's something that, that sociolinguists have been very interested in observing for a long time. Um, the sort of typical sociolinguistic methodology for understanding language change is to focus on changes that take you know, multiple generations to really come into play. So these are typically phonetic changes in terms of how, how vowels are pronounced. Um, so, you know, there are things that you can learn from looking at change on that level, but if we could observe language change that was more rapid, um, we could form maybe a more fine-grained model of the social processes that really, that really underlie language change. Um, and one thing that I think really um, made this kind of really sort of transform the way we could do this kind of research um, is social media, so Twitter in particular. So when we look at Twitter, um, there's just a, a huge number of phenomena that, that, um, that um, we can sort of see in, in real time a word go from, from never being used to being quite popular throughout Twitter. And so this is, this is one of my favorite examples. This is CTFU. The C is for cracking and the U is for up. And so I like this example a lot because um, I think I've seen the first tweet where this word is ever used. Right, and so I think this tweet is from Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know if you can see, the red dots are geotagged tweets that contain this word. And so I think the first tweet ever was Cleveland, Ohio in 2009. By 2010, you, you see that this word is being used in southwestern Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, and a little bit in DC and New Jersey. By 2011, it's spread to other cities like my hometown of Atlanta, um, Chicago, and San Francisco. Um, so this is an example of language change um, on a much more rapid scale than the sorts of language change that are typically studied in sociolinguistics. Um, so, you know, this is, I think, you know, something you could, you could look at a, a phenomenon like CTFU and say this is kind of trivial, like ephemera, like why, you know, why is this important for social science? Um, but like, think about what it takes for a word like CTFU to go from a single tweet to being used by thousands of people per day, right? Like, what would it take for you to use this word? Probably you're not going to think of it yourself. Probably you know, you're going to need to be exposed to it first. So just the fact that you use it tells me you were likely exposed to it through someone else. And that tells me something about who, um, you know, who, who you're connected to socially. Now, you're all in this room, and so now you've seen it. So now you've all been exposed to it. So perhaps you're all going to start using it yourself, um, or perhaps not. And so there's also a social decision that, 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 that's made here, a social evaluation that's made. Is this a term that I want to use? Do I want to be perceived as someone is perceived if they use a term like this? Um, and so it not only tells us about who talks to whom, it tells us about who listens to whom. Now, CTFU is one example. And if you look just at this example, you would conclude that Cleveland is the most influential place in the United States. Um, <laughs> it's, 
as it turns out, not the only such example, and they don't all start in Cleveland. So you know, each of these examples, I think there's a lot of sort of contingent stuff that happens that shapes the trajectory of these innovations in terms of you know, which ones succeed and when they're adopted. Um, and what we'd like to do is you know, each one of these idiosyncratic contingent things, we want to sort of abstract over many of them and figure out what the sort of underlying stuff is that really seems to reliably predict um, the trajectory of many of, the, many of these innovations. What's the aggregate picture? So we, we were able to find actually several thousand of these words whose frequencies change fairly dramatically over a three-year period. Um, we took this data and then we aggregated it both spatially and temporally. So spatially, we were just looking at geotag tweets in the United States. Um, we aggregated into 200, uh, metro, the 200 largest metropolitan areas. Um, temporally, we look at just week by week, and we do that. We have data for a little more than three years, so 165 weeks. Um, then we're gonna, so we, now we have this big tensor, right, where we have words, we have, we have metropolitan areas, and we have weeks. And we want to model this um, as an autoregressive process or as a linear dynamical system. So, um, well, a dynamical system. So specifically what I'm going to say is that the count for each word in each week in each city is um, drawn as a binomial random variable. Um, the um, first parameter of that random variable is just the number of tweets that we have from that place at that time. Um, the frequency parameter has to do with some latent variable that sort of tells me the, the latent activation of this word in this place at that time. And what we imagine is that that latent variable evolves as, an auto, as a first order autoregressive process. So um, all of the activations in each city at time two depend on the activations in each city at time one. And this process just goes forward in time. And so if we can recover this dynamics matrix A, the, the parameters of that matrix tell us which city is talking to which other city. So this is a notion of influence. It's at a fairly coarse grain level. So it's not person to person influence. I'll get to that in a, in a few slides. But here it's city to city influence. OK, and so we can do inference in this kind of model. Um, we use a sequential Monte Carlo technique, again, sort of interleaved with expectation maximization. So the E step is sequential Monte Carlo. Um, uh, and then that gets us an approximate a set of expectations, which we use to do estimation on the parameters. OK, so this is sort of a, a discretized version of that A matrix that emerges from the model. Um, and so these are the city-to-city the -city connections that we're particularly confident about. And I want to emphasize that the model does not know anything about geography. So the actual locations of these cities are not encoded in the model at all. Um, but the picture that emerges in you know, geography seems quite prominent, right? So we have a really dense network of connections on the West Coast, dense network of connections in the Mid-Atlantic, um, and only a few connections that really span large parts of the country. So this might lead you to conclude, oh, and these are mostly mutual connect, mo almost all mutual connections. So in almost every case, um, Seattle influences Portland. Portland also influences Seattle. A few of these are asymmetric, and I'll come to that on, on the next slide. Um, but the question I think you could ask here is like, OK, geography plays a role. Is it the only thing that we need to know about? Is geography sort of the whole story? It would make sense, right? I mean, people's social networks are generally geographically quite locally anchored. I think actually all of us in this room are probably exceptions to that in the sense that, you know, as, as academics, many of us are, are, are maybe far from where we were born and our social networks are maybe more, um, are maybe more spread out. But um, for typical people, we've looked at this for typical people, their networks are generally quite geographically compact. So maybe geography is the whole story. Well, maybe not. So we, 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 we try to look and see what is it about the city pairs that are connected? What is it about those pairs of cities so that distinguishes them from other, other random pairs of cities? Um, geographical distance is a strong predictor. So the further apart two cities are, the less likely they are to share a strong coefficient of influence. Um, but it's not the most important thing. Well, the most important thing is demographics, and speci specifically racial demographics. So the more uh, dissimilar two cities are in terms of racial demographics, the less likely they are to share linguistic influence. The more similar they are, the more likely they are to share linguistic influence. And this, I think, really you know, fits a picture if you, you know, know much about American dialectology. The sort of primary differentiator um, in American English is the difference between African American English and, and white American English. And, and geographical differences are, 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 are much smaller on a sort of any, any relevant dimension um, than that primary difference. Um, these are all symmetric effects. There are also asymmetric effects, so what cities tend to lead and what cities tend to follow. Um, and these are more common sense. So I think larger cities tend to lead um, and younger cities tend to lead. Yeah? How do the conclusions differ if we just use the, the straw man model where you just count the number of, of uh, you know, uh, tweets back and forth? 
the number of tweets, what's a tweet? Yeah, like for example, two cities that respond to each other's tweet, tweets a lot. Oh, okay. Or, or two sub-communities within the city, right? Interesting. Would you predict the same thing with, with that? Interesting. Or, or would it be different? So you can think of other ways to construct like networks of cities, and so like who replies to whom or who retweets whom. Um, might be similar. I haven't, I haven't done it. Yeah, it's, interesting. it's an interesting idea. I mean, I think, yeah, I think so it's, it's likely that what we see here you know, reflects communication patterns like that, right? Um, so that you know, I, I would every reason to believe it would tell you something related to that, yeah. Uh, well, OK, maybe this is more of a discussion point. But this sort of gets back to, the, I think, Pedro's original question about like, covariance. Like, if you think of statistically, what you would like to do is correct for all kinds of effects in, uh, in the population. So if we're trying to come up with theory, you'd like to include some covariates and see if the residual effect of, of these things is still there if you include like, geography. So, uh, so it's not just running it separately, it's like. So I'm running like a multiple regression here, right? You're including, uh, but you have, um, but you don't have an effect for uh, like how connected those two uh, cities are, like unconditionally yeah. based on the number of tweets. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I'm trying to say that it's sort of over and above. Like, that could be part of the explanation, right? Is that, like, people, probably it is part of the explanation. Like, people know each other more, and that, you know, who knows whom is, is part of the story, for sure. If it's not over and above, that seems a little strange that, to, to stress the effect, right? Uh, because if you're saying people in the cities talk to each other more, I, I mean, people in certain cities talk to each other more, and then you get these effects downstream, that seems like a little less. So if that, I mean, right, so, so what, I guess, and probably it's, you know, like, what are you trying to... <laughs> so, okay, so, so in, in one sense, like, you're not going to get any asymmetric effects from that point of view, right? So if I just look at which pairs of cities talk to each other, that's a, that's a, that's a, a purely symmetrical sort of model, right? So, so you, you know, you won't learn sort of who's a leader and who's a follower that way. Um, uh, you know, it's, I guess, so the question is, like, you know, if, if I think cities with similar racial demographics talk to each other more, do I expect you know, even an additional effect for race, you know, when it comes to shaping language change, I don't know. Um, maybe it's important to show that. I'm not, I'm not sure I have to think about that one. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was a picture where I was thinking about influence in terms of um, sort of a coarse grain level of city to city influence. Um, what we'd really like to think about is like person to person influence. Like that would be even, you know, if we could really get down to the level of like what person influenced what other person. And you can think about this almost as like a detective story, right? Like I see person I use this word for the first time at time t. Like who's fault? Who's responsible? Where do I where do I put the blame? Um, did they just think of it themselves, or is there some particular individual that exposed them and led them to adopt it? Um, now the, the the results I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, are, are based on a, a, a free sample that you can get from Twitter. You can get roughly 1% of Twitter data from a, a streaming API. Um, a sample like that, I think, is fine when you're talking about aggregate inferences about cities, but it's not going to work for this kind of person-to-person -person influence analysis, right? Because it's just very unlikely that I see both, if I have a small sample of Twitter data, that I see both the event at IT and the event at JT prime. It's very unlikely that both of those survive sampling. Um, so. Um, to study this question, I, 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 I built a collaboration with researchers at Microsoft Research in New York, um, where I was able to get complete public records for 4 million American Twitter users. Um, when I say complete public records, I don't have their tweets, so I just have record of, of exactly when they use specific words. I had to give them a list of words, and they came back and gave me timestamps for when they used those words, and they gave me social networks. Um, so I have two slides on this, but I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you one. And so the first question you can ask is, like, does the network that I get, um, the uh, network of who follows whom on Twitter, does that tell me, you know, is linguistic influence spreading on that network, or is everything we are observing sort of coming from somewhere else? You could imagine, like, like people see these words on TV or something, and, and then, or they, you know, they, they get them over email or in text messages. Um, is the social network even relevant? Um, and so to answer this question, we do an epidemiological style analysis. And so specifically what we look at, we sort of treat it as like getting a disease. So what's your chance of getting the disease sort of spontaneously? What's your chance of getting the disease given that you've been exposed to the disease by someone on the network? Um, and so we're going to compare the relative risk as the ratio of those two probabilities. And so I can compute the relative risk. Um, but there's still the possibility that there's some like lurking confound, right? That there's maybe I formed a friendship with somebody because we have interest in the same internet slang, and so um, that would give the appearance that there's change happening on the or there's there's influence happening on the network when there is not. Um, and so you can correct for that 
um, by computing the same relative risk statistic um, uh, with, um, completely, with, a, with a randomly rewired network. So you randomly re rewire all the connections, but you preserve sort of the overall um, degree distribution of the network. Um, and then you compute the relative, uh, relative risk in that network as well. And if the relative risk is much higher in your original network, well, that tells you that, that that's a stronger indicator that there really is influence um, on this network. Um, so we looked at three different classes of linguistic innovations. And um, in all three cases, uh, we found a relative risk that was slightly but significantly greater than one. Um, but what I think is interesting that emerges from this picture is that there's a, there's a real difference for, for one of these types of innovations from the other two. What I'm calling phonetic innovations, these are respellings of words um, in ways that s somehow reflect the, the pronunciation of the word. Maybe it's an intuitive spelling of the word based on the pronunciation. Maybe it's a spelling that reflects what you might want to emphasize in the word, um, or uh, if you were to pronounce it out loud. Um, or maybe it's a spelling that reflects your own sort of idiosyncratic pronunciation style. Um, but in any case, um, the, the, the sort of risk profile as the number of exposures increase um, is much sharper for these phonetic variables than it is for the other two types of innovations. Um, and that actually fits a picture that we have from sociology about the adoption of behaviors that are socially risky. So when you want to adopt a behavior that you're worried is going to be negatively evaluated um, by people around you, um, it takes more, more than one exposure um, for that to really be a safe decision for you to make. And I think that's pretty reasonable in this case. So these you know, phonetic spellings, you could just sort of look like you're ignorant and you don't know how to spell. right? So that would be a negative evaluation that you want to avoid. And so waiting to have more, you know, two or three or more exposures before you adopt is a more prudent move in that case. OK, so I had one more piece. So I think I'm going to skip this Hawks process story because um, I really want to get to this, this, um, this causal inference question. And so this, this gets back to some of these existential challenges that tech companies are facing that I, me I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, so hate speech is something that, that many different social media platforms have had to contend with in the last few years. And um, one approach that you could take to hate speech is to try to find the forums where hate speech is present and shut those forums down. And you could see the outcome of this going in like two possible ways. Right? So you could say, well, this, this is going to work um, because, well, you could say it's not going to work because if you shut down the forum that has hate speech, the people that post there are just going to take their hate speech and post it elsewhere. And actually, it's kind of going to be worse because you know, the, maybe the forum was sort of keeping it all in one place where most people didn't have to deal with it. And you shut down the forum, and now it's out in everybody's face. Um, but the other possibility is that the forum itself somehow encourages more hate speech, that the existence of a forum where hate speech is sanctioned um, creates sort of an echo chamber effect, where people use more hate speech than they would otherwise use. So by eliminating the forum, maybe you'll reduce the amount of hate speech overall. So in 2015, Reddit closed several forums for where, where a lot of hate speech was present. And they closed these forums for violation of their anti-harassment policy. And what this does is it enables a natural experiment to test this question that I just gave you on the previous slide about the effectiveness of the intervention. I say it's a natural experiment. It's not like a real experiment, because they didn't like, do a randomized control trial and you know, close some of these subreddits at, uh, at random. Um, they picked them for their own idiosyncratic reasons, so we don't, we don't really know. So we want to do, um, we want to essentially make a causal inference from observational data here. That's what happens in a natural experiment. Um, and so the sort of language for talking about that kind of inference, it, it, you know, it comes from like, like medical experiments. So there's like a treatment group and a control group. The treatment group got the experimental drug. Uh, the control group got the placebo, right? And so in this case, the treatment group, these are user accounts that posted in the, in the subreddits that Reddit then banned. So these were people that were posting in places that had a lot of hate speech. Um, now, we want to find a set of control individuals that are as similar to the treatment group as possible in all respects, except for the treatment. So they're, they're very similar, but they did not post in these specific places that got closed by Reddit for using hate speech. Um, so the way that we do this is we look at forums. So we look at people that posted in the forum that got shut down. FPH stands for Fat People Hate. That was one of these two forums. Um, so these two blue circles posted in that forum. They also posted in these, two tan, in these three um, tan square forums. And so we look at, we, we build a, a, a pool of possible control individuals as people that also posted in these control forums. Um, and then to select specific individuals for each user in the treatment group, we select one user from the control pool, um, one user account from the control pool, who is as similar as possible on every dimension that we could measure. And this is a, a matching approach, which is sort of a classic approach to causal inference. 
so in the end, we get a treatment group, we get a control group. They post and they share the property of posting in a lot of these control forums together, and they're as similar on, ev on every dimension that I can measure as possible. Okay, now we have to measure the amount of hate speech that people are using. Um, to do, I, I, I developed a technique back in 2011 for identifying keywords. Um, it works pretty well for this type of data. Um, so we're able to find keywords that are unusually frequent in each forum. Um, so we didn't want to sort of label a bunch of posts as hate speech or not. There are data sets like that. I have sort of, I'm sort of skeptical about those annotations for various reasons we can, we can discuss offline. Um, but instead, I just use the, the sort of existence of the forum as sort of a proxy to say, what's sort of different about the language in this forum from language that is used elsewhere? Now, some of that is not hate speech, right? So people mention that whatever forum people are posting in, they mention the name of that forum more than other things. And so that's something we can remove from this word list. Um, there's sort of a, a set of words that have arisen around just the act of posting offensive content. But those words are not really hate speech themselves. Um, and then I think the most difficult case are words that are frequently used in sort of hate speech argumentation, but also have uses in non-hate speech discourse as well. And so we eliminate those words as well. Um, and so we, we take this list of 100 keywords, we do this manual analysis, end up with about only 20 remaining. Um, I did this, my graduate student did it. We measured the inter-rater agreement, it was, it was quite high. So we were able to sort of consense on what should be in this list and what should be excluded. Okay, and so these are the results, and I'll take a minute just to walk you through this slide. Um, each of these panels tracks the amount of hate speech in one forum. Um, the x-axis shows time, and at time zero, that's when the intervention happens. So that's when the forum shut down. Um, sorry, the counts are hate speech um, by these individual user accounts. The forum shuts down, there's no more speech of any kind in that forum. But the people that posted there continue to post elsewhere. Um, and so the, the y-axis is the fraction of tokens that match our hate speech lexicon. Um, on the top, we have the manually filtered lexicon that my student and I did. On the bottom, we have the original 100 keywords. Um, we wanted to have something that was sort of completely automated, and so that, that's what's on the bottom. So this is on the right, this is a fraction of hate keywords on a different, uh, on a different site, or just the overall? In Reddit, but in different forums. So Reddit has many different forums. Right, so but, but you're including the hate speech they're using in the forms that were shut down on the on the y-axis. Uh, yeah, before the um, yeah before the cutoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah before the cutoff. Yeah, yeah. Then after the cutoff, those forums are closed, so no one posts there anymore. Yeah, um, and so what we see, you know, at the time of the treatment, a dramatic drop in the amount of hate speech that people used. Um, no sort of corresponding drop in the control group, which tells us that there isn't some exogenous reason that hate speech was decreasing, that it really does seem to be due to the treatment. Um, the left column is one forum that was closed for hate speech. Um, the right column is another one. So just two, to, they closed two forums at this time. Okay, so we, uh, we wrote this paper um, a day or two after it came out. Um, it was posted to Reddit. Um, it became the most popular story on Reddit. So one thing Reddit really likes is uh, research papers about Reddit, it turns out. <laughs> um, so this is, this is 47,000 upvotes for the story. Um, I've told you the piece about the language side, but another sort of piece of the story is that many of the accounts that were used to post to these forums that had hate speech, many of those accounts were abandoned. So people abandoned their accounts at much higher than the base rate after this policy went into place. People on Reddit had a, whoops, people on Reddit had a lot of interesting sort of questions and comments specifically about the linguistic side of the research. So how did you identify what qualifies for hate speech? Did you bring you know, your own sort of liberal bias or something into this um, conversation? And that's, that's actually one reason I, I felt it was really essential in the paper to include both the, uh, the, the, the sort of unfiltered set of words that the algorithm gave us as well as the filtered set of words that we produced. I think the filtered words are more valid, but uh, I was just concerned that people would think I was injecting my own bias into the filtering. And so I have a sort of unfiltered version as well. Yeah. But how do you know that people didn't go outside of Reddit? Ah, because uh, people certainly did. People certainly did go outside of Reddit. So um, in that sense, um, asking whether it worked, you have to sort of ask yourself like what you mean by did it work. So um, you know, is your goal? But not maybe it worked for Reddit, but not for society at large. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, so, so uh, one thing that happened is people started sort of alternatives to Reddit that were very similar in structure, but you know, we're really dedicated to the principle that there would be no control of content whatsoever. And many people that posted this kind of content went there. Um, almost no one else went there, right? So you can, you know, from Reddit's perspective, definitely a win. Um, from society's perspective, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what fraction of these hate speech words occurred in the, just the sites that were shut down? Because like, wouldn't you just get some effect where 
if you just close all the sites down that had speed, hate speech, you just see a drop uh, in the amount of hate, uh, hate speech. Or like, were there any sites that had like uh, were, that had like a lot of these words in it that weren't shut down? I see. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So there were a number of th yes. Near term, you would just expect a drop. Is sort of what I was trying to do. Right. Just right. Although I mean, if everything's you, correlated with sites that shut down, then of course you're. Right. So. Right, so we had this sort of set of control forums where people from hate speech groups tended to post. And if you look at what was going on in those forums, um, there's a lot of hate speech in those places um, as well. Um, okay, and, and, and maybe, uh, but you, you don't have the plot for how much hate speech was going on in those other forums. Like if you shut down the, the hate speech forum, do they sort of decrease the amount of hate speech on other forums? Or does it stay the same, or does it increase? Or, or am I missing? Well, so it seems to decrease, right? Because nothing, like once I cross zero on the x-axis, like the hate speech forums, well, no, no, I don't. So the, the the treatment forums have disappeared, right? So you can't post there anymore. Um, so the total amount of hate speech that these people, sorry, that's the total, but it's not yeah. on the sites. I think what Sean wants is the non the non shutdown forums on yeah. the left side of that line. Yes. Yeah. How much? Yeah, yeah. That, that's basically because that's sort of where it seems seems like the okay. Yeah. Just yeah. looking at the other. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I'll th yeah, think about that. Um, okay, so people were quite interested in knowing how we picked these words. Um, one thing that happened shortly after the paper came out is that Reddit decided this was a good strategy and um, expanded it dramatically, so they, they shut down many more such forums. Um, this is another sort of causal inference question that we won't know the answer to as to whether our research paper had any role in that, don't know. Um, but um, sort of thinking about whether it worked and why it worked. Um, so in terms of why it had the effect that it had, Reddit has this kind of interesting federated structure where Individual forums have moderators, and those moderators generally have more or less complete freedom to decide what is acceptable in that forum. Um, so, you know, if you like to post, like the forum that I go to on Reddit is like for bike mechanics. Like, if you like to post a lot of hate speech and you try to post it in the bike mechanic forum, like the moderators of that forum will just kick you out, right? And so they sort of delegated a lot of the moderation um, to these individuals that control the specific forums. Um, and then, if you eliminate the forums where hate speech is sanctioned, um, there are not a lot of places left for people to go. Um, and so that's you know, potentially one reason why this worked for Reddit and would be maybe difficult to replicate in a place like Twitter or Facebook. Um, so the question was about whether people go to alternative sites other than Reddit. Um, for sure, some people did. Um, from Reddit's perspective, this might be a win. Um, from the perspective of people that use Reddit frequently, like myself, this might be a win. Um, but from like a, is the amount of hate speech in the world overall decreasing, um, don't know. Um, and then you know, I think our algorithms, of course, only detect specific subsets of hate speech, and we really focus on things that we can detect lexically in individual words. Um, so I think it's always possible that just the, what, what changed really was the character of hate speech, and people maybe expressed the same hateful thoughts um, in different ways that were more difficult to detect. That's always a possibility. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears now. I've been talking about research the whole time. I wanna talk about a few other things as professors. That's not the only thing that we do, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, so one big part of what I do at Georgia Tech has to do with building a community around computational social science. Um, I've organized and co-organized doctoral consortia at EMNLP and ACL uh, on computational social science, in one case with NOAA. Um, I've organized a series of consortia in the Atlanta area. You know, Georgia Tech is a, essentially a tech school. We don't have a lot of social science research at Georgia Tech. Um, so I've organized consortia bringing together people from Georgia Tech with people from Emory and Georgia State. Um, and so we did that three, um, three different years. Um, I organized a panel on computational sociolinguistics at the American um, Society for the Advancement of Science. Um, on the teaching side, I, I created a course on computational social science that I've taught three times now. It's sort of a course, we have the structure where every week we have a different sort of high level topic. Um, the students will read a social science paper every week. So for computer scientists who have never read social science papers before, they'll read, discuss, present such papers every week. Um, social scientists have taken the classes as well. Um, every week we introduce a new computational concept. We'll have a little lab session at the end of the second lecture each week um, where people work through a Jupyter notebook that I create uh, where they can sort of apply these methods. And then the assignment basically is to take those labs um, and extend them and do something creative and original um, on their own for students. 
Um, there's a course on computational journalism. I actually did not invent the course myself, although I redesigned it. Um, I took it over from uh, Professor Irfan Issa. Um, and this is a kind of a neat, it's essentially a data science course as well, targeted more at undergraduates and from a journalism perspective. Um, specifically targets, we have a, a program at Georgia Tech in computational media, um, which is within sort of the family of computational degrees that we offer. Um, but um, uh, considerably more diverse than our computer science program, for example, at Georgia Tech. Um, and so that's a, a fun group of students to, um, to bring these topics to. Um, and then I, I, I teach a course on natural language processing that I basically redesigned from scratch when I came to Georgia Tech. Um, I have a textbook under contract with um, MIT Press on that topic. That'll be done later this spring. Um, right. So to summarize, I think hopefully I've convinced you that computation and social science, if you didn't believe it already, are inextricably uh, linked. Um, if I think about the progress of computational social science, you could maybe divide it into sort of a first wave and a second wave. So a lot of the early work in computational social science, if you look at the paper from David Lazar et al., um, they focus on things like large-scale instrumentation, crowdsourcing, and a lot of network analysis. I think the next wave for computational social science is artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I think you know, being able to really measure what people mean and operationalize um, social phenomena um, and make you know, more sensitive measurements really than what we could do um, with just you know, simple word counting. I think that's really where the field of computational social science is headed, and that's why I think UW would be an amazing place um, to continue this trajectory. Um, I'll just give a little teaser. You know, this sort of goes both ways. So it's not just computation as a new tool for social science, but also social science ideas coming back and making computer science more robust. And so I had a line of research with my PhD student, Yi Yang, on using social network ideas to make natural language processing software more robust to language variation as well. Okay, so let me acknowledge my great uh, students and collaborators and sponsors, um, and I'd be happy to take questions from you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. So thinking with the broad brush, I would say that most of the computational social science work today has been bringing you know, all the data that we now have on computational tools to study social con concepts and phenomenon theories that we already have in our minds. But, a, but an equally exciting or maybe even more exciting possibility is where we might develop whole new concepts and theories and whatnot coming from all the observations that we can now do. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that and what those might be? Yeah, I mean, that was, I think that, so I've used unsupervised machine learning a lot in my work, and I think that's, that sort of drives, I think that's driven by that sort of agenda. So um, if I have a data set, can I just explore it and see sort of what structure emerges, and that does, does that drive new sort of theorizing about what's present in that data? So if, you know, I mentioned this collaboration with a sociolinguist at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we're essentially doing you know, sort of glorified factor analysis, again, on Reddit posts. Um, but what we're, what, what we're able to sort of pull out from that or di are different sort of ling what he calls linguistics, like interpersonal stances, so ways people have of interacting with each other. Some of that fits sort of existing theoretical constructs like formality and respect and politeness. Um, others have sort of challenged us to, to rethink um, the sort of inventory that we had in mind. Um, for, part, for the second part of your talk, um, when you were discussing uh, the shift for the phonetic like variation, did you consider the possibility that changing the phonetic or the spelling of a word would was actually potentially changing the meaning of the word, like due to say a news item or something like a pun or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, I, yeah, I, I have like a whole paper on phonetic variation in spelling or phonetically motivated variation in spelling, and I think um, like absolute. So so to be clear about what we are measuring there. Um, so the assumption is that every spelling is a new innovation, basically. Every, every new spelling is, a, is an innovation. So we don't, we, we're not sort of equating uh, an alternative spelling to the original spelling um, in, in maybe the way that you would do in like a typical variation of sociolinguistic analysis. We're basically treating each spelling as a new thing. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of what is the social meaning of alternative spellings, I think that's a really rich topic, actually. So um, as you try to connote maybe an informal way of pronouncing a word, or you try to connote um, a heavily accented way of pronouncing a word according to some sort of caricatured accent, um, that's all stuff that can happen in these phonetic spellings. Uh, so what's been the, uh, the reaction of the more traditional social sciences to this approach? I mean, I, I take it they have their own uh, philosophies and methodologies, and this is you know, coming at it from a different direction. So what has been that reaction like? 
Yeah, so I think the, I've had the most engagement with sociolinguistics as a field. Um, and you know, I think the reaction has generally been positive. So I've been able to publish three papers now in sort of sociolinguistics field-specific journals, Journal of Sociolinguistics, Journal of American Speech. Um, I've given talks on this stuff at sociolinguistics conferences. Um, you know, I think I would love to see more sociolinguists doing this kind of work. To me, that would really be, you know, People can come and ask nice questions at the talk, but I'd really like to see them doing it themselves. Um, and I think that's been a little slower, um, but I think it is happening. Actually, I've heard about some cool research here at UW in linguistics that, that, that's going in that direction this morning. I say political science is, 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 you know, I think Noah's more plugged into that community. They're, they're fairly advanced, actually, in the use of computational methods, and they can, they can do things like write customized topic models and, 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 and that kind of stuff. So it seems like a lot of what you're presenting here is really tied into what we're seeing in the news right now with the fake news, the, the Russian postings, the how, does, how does Facebook respond, um, corporate directions. Is that kind of, am I correct in, in making that connection? I mean, yeah, I think, I think a lot of this stuff you know, definitely is, is relevant and of interest um, to, to corporate, especially social media corporations. I think. You know, their survival and their success really depends on handling these issues well, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, the problem is I think it's, it's difficult for them sometimes to do this kind of research themselves or to publish this kind of research themselves because, you know, the results are not always things maybe that they'll want to share. Right. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, back to the thing about um, cities adopting different lexical items on Twitter. Uh, how did you decide which features to look at for how influential they were with each other? So we basically had like a, like you mean which linguistics features or which city? Um, which features of cities? Like how do you decide oh. to look at population? Yeah. Or Is that just kind of like try and see what works? So we got like, you know, it was, it was more like what, what is easily available from the US Census. So that was the, that was sort of the, the predominant thing. And then, you know, yeah, so stuff that, right, stuff that like we easily available like year to year um, has been used in other research about what differentiates cities. Like I'll see, you can you can find out all kinds of crazy statistics, like number of plumbing fixtures per household. You know, we thought was like probably not super relevant, but we wanted something that proxied for socioeconomic status, so we used median income. But you know, there are like a lot of things you could do. Um, you could take that for, if you have ideas about how to take that further. Um, it's relatively easy to integrate other other covariates like that. Okay, it's 4:30, so we should thank the speaker. Thank you.